This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello everyone, welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Today I have with me Gemma thomas Bohr, who is the Toddler trans- Translator and Extreme and Challenging Behaviour Specialist. Thank you Gemma for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. So we're going to discuss uh, challenging behaviour and the adult's role. So we've got quite a few things um, to discuss. So let's um, kick off by maybe, Gemma, you'd like to give us a little kind of intro about yourself and what you do. And I'm particularly interested in your title of the toddler translator. (laughs) Thank you. So, yes, I have been working with children since I was 18 years old. I am now 33. (laughs) (laughs) so quite a while um and I started off in the nursery background so nursery Mm -hmm. practitioner and everything like that and so most of my focus was quite on the child Mm -hmm. um and then as my career progressed I went into the children's activity sector and that's where you are still with the child but the parent is there as well so you have quite a lot more interaction with the parent Mm -hmm. and Through that process, I had a lot of parents starting to ask because child development is my speciality. If you go Mm -hmm. right, right down into its core, um, child development. So they'd ask me loads of these different questions. And I noticed that there was so much that parents don't understand, don't know what's going on because they haven't been taught these kind of things. And there's loads of things to do with, with babies and how to wean them, how to help with sleep, all these kind of things. There's something that seems to be a reoccurring problem. I would, mm-hmm. I'm probably going to use the word problem quite loosely. Mm-hmm. Um, but lots of parents and even practitioners are really struggling with children's behaviour. And mm-hmm. yeah. I would say most, not all, but most parents now are starting to be around their millennials. Mm-hmm. I count myself as one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at how we were brought up, Mm-hmm. and I think how our parents and I had quite young parents how they would have, I think it's that turning point of children should be seen and not heard mm-hmm. slash yeah see then that bit of oh no you need to be free and wild and have this conflict so millennials have this kind of problem where they're trying to figure out how to deal with this do we be mm-hmm. super strict like our parents were or be super loose about it and and mm-hmm. so you just don't have any of these kind of directions And so I've come in with the toddler translator because Mm -hmm. I'm here to translate what the child is communicating because behaviour of any sort is communication. Yeah, It doesn't have to be words. It can be body language. It can be movement. It can be a lack of speech. Mm -hmm. It's all communication. And the toddler translator, to be honest, I did did pick toddlers because nine times out of ten, it's that that time period and also alliteration it worked really nicely (laughs) (laughs) yeah it sounds great (laughs) thank you so yeah that's that's what I'm really focused on and I my ultimate goal is creating a positive and peaceful home so that every single family member can thrive and this Mm -hmm. can go through into nurseries if you can create a positive and peaceful environment for the children that you're looking after then every Mm -hmm. single staff member and child will thrive Mm -hmm. I think that's what's important Mm-hmm. yeah oh well your role does sound really interesting um thank you especially working with toddlers like you mentioned you know that kind of time period that developmental um period is very challenging let's say um because the children at that kind of toddler stage are really working out themselves and their own behaviors and you know how they react to things um their own interests and I guess emotions is the biggest thing isn't it yeah well, I think what's important that so many adults come into when they have a tan- like a child is having a tantrum or challenging behaviour, whether it's aggressiveness or or the complete opposite and they just shut down, mm-hmm. is we do not have logic fully formed until we are 25 years old. 25? I 25. thought you were going to say like five or something. <laughs> no, 25 is a fully developed logical system of the brain 
So wow. trying to get an 18 month old, a two year old to think logically is essentially pointless. It mm. is a pointless exercise. And also if you're coming at the child who's in an emotional response here, complete stress mm -hmm. or, or frustration, whatever it is, if you come in with logic, it's just gonna bounce straight off. You need yeah. to think and address the emotional response that is happening rather mm -hmm. than dealing it with it in a logical way because it just won't work. Mm, I can kind of relate to that from my own personal perspective as an adult, actually, um, <laughs> beyond 25, <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of kind of thinking the times when I've struggled in kind of different relationship situations of different people of like, I need my emotions to and my feelings to be recognized first um and accepted and then we can discuss whether this is a logical response you know whether this is helpful you know um because it comes from you know all these different podcasts and books and everything that we read now around mental health and well-being and emotions of like this feeling or emotion is um is a, is a sign you know yeah. and it has to happen um yeah. you know it exists it is real um it's it's not you overreacting it is just you doing what you need to do and it's important to acknowledge that first and then we can look at okay is this the best way of going about this right now or you know how can we I guess channel this emotion first we need to let it out and it's happening for a reason I guess isn't it absolutely like the situations that happen with toddlers is exactly the same what happens with adults mm -hmm. adults have tantrums in, like if you're having it where your child is having a full meltdown and you've been dealing with this really frustrating behavior and you're getting to the end of your tether and you start shouting you're having your mm -hmm. own tantrum you are mm -hmm. which happens we're not trying to mm -hmm. build parents to be robots that's not remotely the case or mm -hmm. even again any um early years practitioner we're not trying to build robots that can't have any mm -hmm. feeling can't express themselves but we were speaking even beforehand about burnout. That is how your mm -hmm. body is showing you that you mm -hmm. are at the end of your tether. You are building up this emotional reaction mm -hmm. and your stress responses are going out of control. If you don't address mm -hmm. this in an emotional way, because that is what it is. They're all emotional responses, all emotional communication. Mm -hmm. And you try to just hit it with logic of like, no, I need to do my work. I need to do this. This is my deadline. This is what's going on. Or no, I need my child to get to nursery. I need them to be able to do this. I need to go shopping because we haven't got any food. If you deal with this in a logical way, it's not going to get resolved. Because mm -hmm. you're, you're not acknowledging nothing... yeah. that emotion. Because that emotion still needs to happen and be processed and be given space Absolutely. and time, doesn't it? And I guess when you said um, about um, kind of adults experiencing that burnout, and I kind of see it in terms of what I call it, for myself it's like having a, a bit of a breakdown you know you are literally yeah. your emotions are breaking down your regulation is breaking down um yeah. and just on the topic of kind of terminology and language it's interesting that you mentioned the word tantrum because I know that there's been kind of a lot of um discourse around that term in the past year especially in the early childhood yeah. sector and it's like do we use the word tantrum or do you use, use the word self-regulation um and it's understanding what's appropriate I guess um because the word tantrum may not always has not always been used in a kind of uh, understanding and sensitive way towards children that's why a lot of yep. practitioners and professionals often use the term self-regulation you know they're struggling to self-regulate their emotions but then on the other hand you work with parents a lot so yeah. it's do they understand that term self-regulation that's the other argument but if they don't why don't we teach them that so yeah so from your perspective the word tantrum parents understand and you use that's that exactly word. it it's if you start going into if you, it's essentially using lingo that mm -hmm. professionals use yeah. which can then make parents feel isolated out mm -hmm. but I don't understand yeah. that that's a big term even though as soon as yeah. you start picking it apart you're like it's it's not it's the same as if mm -hmm. for instance you go to get a mortgage and they start using all these insur insurance jargon and you're yeah, like, yeah. I don't know what you're saying. And then your brain just switches off. Mm -hmm. If yep, you can make totally it approachable. To that. It, mm. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think if. Um, not making tantrum a bad word. 
Mm. You're giving this word an energy that it doesn't need. Mm -hmm. If you just explain it and make it more approachable, so not take essentially take away that stigma. Mm -hmm. Look what we've done with mental health. Mm -hmm. If you look at that 100 years ago, Mm. yeah, it's a completely different thing. It's the same word, completely Mm, different approach. But if we take tantrum, which parents will understand, Mm-hmm. professionals understand they even know the difference between a tantrum and a meltdown because those are two very different things as well mm-hmm. if we just make take this element of a stigma tantrum away and yes that bit of oh it's a child they're just having a tantrum they can deal with it on their own if you mm-hmm. go actually no tantrum is this type of behavior mm-hmm. so you know what you're dealing with what to understand so for instance a tantrum a child is still able to understand and to be reasoned with a meltdown absolutely not you cannot (laughs) reason with a child in a full meltdown so if you give these words more meaning give them Mm -hmm. easy to use descriptions then everybody Mm -hmm. can use it rather than adding this positive or negative connotations to them Mm -hmm. that's how I would have it yes you can add a negative connotation to it absolutely could be like yes it's promoting this whole a child is on their own to deal with this Mm -hmm. but words have power you can absolutely turn that around and go well actually yes it did mean that but going forward this is how we're going to use it and Mm -hmm. I believe it's it's just about giving people the understanding of what the behavior is with understanding Mm -hmm. you can then move forward and that's how ultimately is like the the core of how I work with my parents and other professionals understanding Mm -hmm. And translating that behavior, that communication is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, like you say, it's about reinventing that language, isn't it? Because unfortunately, it does already exist. It does already have those negative connotations. So it's about reinventing, retranslating and communicating that to parents and carers. Absolutely. And that as, as an industry, as a profession, that's our job. Mm -hmm. I think it can easily fall into what's right, what's right and what's wrong. So my belief isn't a tantrum is bad. It's not bad. It's also not good. It's neutral. It's just energy. Mm-hmm. If your child is really happy, they can have just the same amount of outbursts with this high energy mm-hmm. happiness as high, en- high energy anger. It's energy. It's mm-hmm. neither positive or negative. It's how it's used could mm-hmm. be positive or negative but the actual emotion itself is neutral we apply that mm-hmm. so I guess it's how do we as adults react or respond to the child's behavior so there is that difference as well isn't it between uh what's a reaction and what's a response mm-hmm. so that instant reaction is like this is how I'm um taking this instantly in that moment and th- this is kind of my sudden reaction without almost that logic or understanding that this is someone's this is this child's behavior or this is how how they're feeling um a response is more considered absolutely I think uh, you you need to think about this realistically like if you are sleep deprived if you've got more than one child if you've got any of these kind of things Mm -hmm. like I was saying you cannot be a robot you cannot even yourself say I cannot feel these things because I need to be a good role model and put all this pressure upon yourself Mm -hmm. as well what it is is just being realistic about it there's going to be times you'll lose your temper there might be even times where you lose your temper at each other Mm -hmm. but it's how you deal with that as well so it's not again it keeps it neutral yes you've had this big big explosion of emotion yourself Mm -hmm. and then you can if it's at your child I'm sure the guilt's then are going to kick in and that's going to make you feel rubbish if you just go I'm going to say mummy just because I am female um but male or female however you see yourself it, it's irrelevant it's exactly the same mm-hmm. thing so I'm just like I said I'm using money as I am a, a female is mummy sorry mummy shouted and that wasn't very kind of me I hope you can understand can I have a hug or something like that mm-hmm. just so that you can say I acknowledge that I messed up Mm -hmm. this is how I'm dealing with it I'm checking in with you to make sure that you're okay and let's Mm -hmm. kind of reconcile 
mm-hmm. where if you just shout moan kind of have all this big blowout and just go well I'm the adult so I can do that mm-hmm. that's all you're teaching your child or teaching the child is when I'm big I can shout louder or they'll just shout louder and go like I just need to get bigger and louder mm-hmm. and then I'll be able to do it that yeah. kind of thing and I think it's it's not adding guilt and saying you cannot feel like this it's just how mm-hmm. we cope with it and how we promote it to our children mm-hmm. in how we deal with our emotions because they are natural every single emotion is natural you cannot say to a child that angry is bad Mm-hmm. or that because you're just setting them up to feel rubbish about ourselves later which mm-hmm. if you look at the, the mental health these days of how in, when we were little like you need to give them a kiss and a hug of an adult if you didn't want to that was quite mm-hmm. normal to go come on you need to give them a kiss and a hug that kind of thing or if you are having a bad day as a child it's like you're being naughty it's like mm-hmm. no every human being is going to have good days and bad days we just have this high expectations that children aren't supposed to have bad things. They must and behave I, at all times. I guess modelling that as an adult is saying that it's okay for the child to have these behaviours, like you're saying, you know, it's okay yeah. to have a bad day. But And then it also um, encourages them to share and release these emotions, even if they are upset or angry or frustrated. It's encouraging them to realise that it's okay to have this emotion. They're not they're not naughty or bad you know for having these emotions because it's so important to be able to release them otherwise they will grow up into you know uh, older children teenagers and adults who are constantly busting their emotions which is just so 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 unhealthy absolutely and I think looking at my generation definitely and you see how heavily they are affected with their Mm -hmm. mental health is because it was oppressed of you cannot yeah. kick off, you cannot do this, you cannot do the other. And I'm sure generations before me will say it's even worse than those kind of things. Mm. I can only speak about my, my yeah. generation and look at it and go like, let's see how people are dealing with this. But if we're able to teach the children of the current generation, of it is perfectly fine to feel these emotions. We are human mm. beings. You cannot go through life and not be angry Mm -hmm. it's how you deal with that emotion that's important Mm -hmm. and I use this term a lot is we are shepherds you cannot mold a child through what you do or anything like that you can't try and make them into something that they are not they are who Mm -hmm. they are what we can do is provide a positive environment give them the right nourishment in any Mm -hmm. kind of form of food and um experiences all these kind of things we are here to provide this experience for them Mm -hmm. and help angle them in a way that can help support them we can't change who they are and by saying that you this child is never angry like it's just adding an extra level of pressure Mm -hmm. which again can encourage challenging and extreme behavior Mm -hmm. so the question I guess I wanted to ask you is in if you are working with a parent and they're really struggling to um I guess deal with their child's big emotions how would what would you say to them how would you recommend that they deal with a situation where the child is having a tantrum or struggling to regulate their emotions so there's a few steps that I would take I if it was just speaking to the parent obviously I would go Mm -hmm. straight to and then if it was for instance a practitioner who's dealing with this parent then I would say the same thing to say to this so mm-hmm. just kind of you'd have a middle person there mm-hmm. first point is to add an element of self-care now parents have this quite a lot of guilt around self-care mm-hmm. um, because again we've had this society that's built in that your child must come first they are the absolute priority the thing is, if you're not running in a, even like 80%, it's mm-hmm. going to affect your child. You need to come in with the mm-hmm. glass half full rather than half empty. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you're not looking after yourself, you cannot look after your child at your best ability. 
Now, I mm. do three very simple things, which I know we spoke out, spoke before mm. the podcast. And they're simple. They're easy. They're not adding any pressure to me. Is I have a glass of water. I write three things that I am grateful for each day. And it could be literally, I have a really lovely big bed that I get to sleep in. Or I'm grateful for that I've got squash in my house. <laughs> it can be <laughs> simple things. It doesn't have anything. But I believe if you're you feel good about what you have it's just going to keep adding this positivity and it resets your mind and then I move so mine is I take the dog for a walk these mm-hmm. can be simple things it could be to make sure you have a cup of tea it could be um put out your favorite clothes it could it doesn't have to be a pressure but mm-hmm. so just go like I'm going to do three things that are non-negotiable that are for me at mm-hmm. least sets off your day it doesn't have to be the morning I think it's a good idea to do in the morning um but that really helps so if you come in into this environment already feeling happier in yourself mm-hmm. that will have a really good positive effect on the child the next bit would be finding the behavior trigger this mm-hmm. is the the first step after looking after yourself so you know that you can deal with this behavior as best as you can you, if you cannot find the trigger you cannot solve the problem you can get close to it but essentially it's throwing pasta at the wall and hoping to see what sticks mm. so you need to find what it is and the simple steps to finding the trigger is collecting data mm. is what is going on with the child when it happens where is it that they're where they are was there anyone around doing a timing has anything changed in their routine that day finding what it is collecting this over a space of time Mm -hmm. then after that find the pattern find the pattern there will always be a pattern there's not a child is just being stubborn the child just this or the child just that there's there's always Mm -hmm. a reason again it's all behavior is all about communication Mm -hmm. um and then once you've found that you can then create a strategy of right i know that um on this day because they go to nursery that they're tired so their their fuse is a lot shorter those Mm -hmm. kind of things or they've got a new sibling so Mm -hmm. there's been a change and so that's creating the behavior so you can draw it back ah okay it happened when this happened Mm -hmm. it these kind of simple things you'd be surprised what these triggers can be it can be the fact that something's inconsistent Mm-hmm. it could be some a big thing happened that caused a fear response and now their behavior is triggered because they don't want to go back to that that situation mm-hmm. again so by finding that trigger you can absolutely then find a way to resolve the strategy so resolve the behavior by mm-hmm. creating a strategy mm-hmm. I guess sometimes it might help to, like you said, look at that pattern um, over a series of events. So perhaps writing it down, you know, the time of day it happened. Yeah. Like you say, when it was when he was around, um, almost keeping a log. Yeah. It you mm-hmm. cannot again. You can't once you when you're really in it. It's a lot easier to say it for me because I'm outside and obviously mm-hmm. have spoken to lots and lots of different parents, lots of different clients, and things like that. So it's easy for me to go like, okay, here's, I use the term red flag. It's not a negative mm-hmm. bit. It's just like a term that I use. Go right, mm-hmm. there's the red flag. There's the red flag. Or here's the bell. Whatever term you want to use, mm-hmm. you will see it. I can see it quite easily. But obviously, if you're not trained in it and you haven't got that mm-hmm. experience, you need to have, to have it right there in front of you to be able to see it. It could be essentially mm-hmm. they struggle with sharing. Now, if you've got a child under three, they don't know how to share through mm-hmm. obviously if you look through the play stages and how they interact with children to try and ex- trying to get a three-year-old to share is nigh on impossible <laughs> and get, so if you notice that each time it's where somebody's interrupting their play and getting involved mm-hmm. and they start then kicking off then you can then help them through that and give them different experiences to be able to help encourage that or again you start playing a lot more with them and going right let, let's give them these opportunities to learn how to or even a way to be they no without it blowing up mm-hmm. that kind of thing so it's just finding ways to be able to translate their behavior into something that you understand mm-hmm. and then you can help them 
and support them as a shepherd, mm-hmm. as I said before, giving them mm-hmm. the right environment to help them thrive. And so that's that kind of reflect reflective element um, when you're kind of able to step back, I guess, and have a look at the situation. Yeah. What about in the moment when the child is really struggling um, to regulate their emotion? What would you recommend to parents or practitioners or how how do you kind of normally support them? So I've got I, I call them the three C's. I think there is another term of there's some another term that also uses these three C's that they're slightly mm-hmm. different wording. But these are the ones that I use is calm, compassion and communication. And they go in that order because you cannot have compassion and communication if you are not calm yourself. Mm, yeah. So you need to calm because you need to bring all that energy back down. Otherwise, you're just adding more energy to the environment and it's just going to mm-hmm. go up and up and up like fire. Mm-hmm. So you need to calm. So even if it means that you just stand back, breathe, whatever it is that you need to do. Do you know what? Even if it's like... Um, the film with Charlotte when she shuts herself in mm. in the um, <laughs> cupboard for insects in the city, that kind of thing where you're like, do you know what? I just need to have calm that moment. Mm-hmm. So once you're calm and then you can go, and this is the bit where we talk about logical approach and an emotional response. Mm-hmm. If you can go to your child or their child and say, I understand how you feel. I have felt the same way. Now, obviously, the younger mm-hmm. they are, go, I get you're sad keep I'm gonna I'm starting to go into the third step but Mm -hmm. if you go in that and understand that your child is upset is angry Mm -hmm. and they're doing an emotional response feel it with them you don't have to be Mm -hmm. angry with them but kind of like I get it yeah I get Mm it I can rather than go Mm -hmm. exactly rather than go you're doing this that's Mm -hmm. not helping and then communicating now this is super relevant is making sure it's stage relatable Mm -hmm. there is no point going into too much detail with a two-year-old you need to keep it simple and precise but Mm -hmm. if you went to a a five-year-old with something that's super simple and precise it's not enough so you Mm -hmm. need to make sure your communication is relevant to the stage that they are in but by the time you get to communication your the whole situation will have calmed down so if you just think calm compassionate and communication in -hmm. that moment it will come down. The first time it might not work perfectly. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're not perfect people. But with practice, it'll get quicker and it'll get more efficient. Mm. And this reminds me back, um, takes me back to that conversation we were having about language. Um, so the use of terminology, because what you're describing here, I can see in terms of the professional educational kind of side of things as being co-regulation so yeah. you're you know regulating together you're co-regulating with your child but if you were to discuss that with parents again it's that kind of language that they're perhaps not used to um yeah. but yeah it's essentially that isn't it just broken down into those three steps um exactly so you're you're really supporting that that behavior and perhaps it might be by through that physical touch as well um giving them a hug or just putting your if it's a practitioner and a child um perhaps putting your arm around them or um your hand on their your hand on their shoulder um and what else was I going to say um so yeah physical touch and also um synchronizing breathing as well yeah and that's when that physical touch also comes in you know if you hug someone naturally your breathing synchronizes and so you the person who is calm you know like as you say you have to be calm first it then calms down the other person who is struggling with the child that may be struggling to to regulate their behavior if they're in that fight or flight mode you know yep. their breathing the heart rate increases their breathing is fast so just holding them you know just holding someone even in silence um really supports that synchronization of breathing that co-regulation it can even be not like it, like proximity is what I'm trying mm. to get at is you don't have to hold the child it could be mm-hmm. holding the space mm. because some yeah. children if you get close and they're still cross that could escalate it mm. I'm not That's saying like you point. now have to but it's just again you need mm. to understand the child that you're you're yeah, coping with. know your unique child exactly unique because child, yeah and it's it's not a negative thing towards the adult. Like some mm-hmm. adults aren't particularly touchy feely. So you will mm-hmm. have children that are also not touchy feely. 
so it that can aggravate them and then you've got a whole mm -hmm. another branch that's now come out of it you're no longer dealing with the initial catalyst mm -hmm. you're now dealing with something else yeah so if you know that your child if they're upset and you're going to to cuddle them mm -hmm. and they're going to feel smothered then all you've got to do is like I am here mm -hmm. that is still being compassionate yeah. and again if you again co-regulating is I am mm -hmm. here you are not alone Mm -hmm. I'm here if you need me where obviously if you've got a particularly sensitive child then yeah they'll want that that touch that oxytocin rush the love mm -hmm. hormone to flood through them to help them calm so and it is again you trying to communicate with a angry stressed frustrated hungry <laughs> child <laughs> will be pointless so you need mm -hmm. you both to calm down and like you said just having that co-regulation Mm -hmm. in being there with them is important mm -hmm. like you say holding that space for them and I guess mm. that that reminds me of the important um, consideration of uh, consent and the yeah. children's rights in yeah. terms of do they want to be hugged do they want to be touched um, and really modeling that because in a wider context you know that was um tap into issues of kind of safeguarding and things like that you yeah know, they they like you were saying earlier it used to be I guess appropriate um to to say to a child go and give so and so a hug and if they say they don't want to then they're they're seen as being rude but actually yeah you know we need to respect their wishes their needs and their preferences and say I can see that you're sad would you like a hug can exactly. I hug you yeah yeah and it is, it's, it's a completely different, it's the same thing, but from a different angle. Mm -hmm. It's not come hug me, mm -hmm. would you like a hug? Giving so, them that choice and agency, isn't exactly. it? And, and that ownership. Exactly. And we know that children work best when they have options, not a multitude, because that can be mm -hmm. overwhelming and that can create an opposite effect. But would you like a cuddle? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And it's it's important to give those children, I I unless they're starting again five six seven eight you can add more but if you've got yeah. a two to three year old it's a or b yes or no those things mm -hmm. just keep it simple because then you're not dealing with any kind of overwhelm here yeah. and then that can escalate things but into a, into a different issue that is not even necessary and exactly. i guess it's placing that control in their hands as well isn't it because that's yeah. so important in order to be able to regulate their own emotions I think this bit, and I th I'm going to pick on the word that you said, control. And mm -hmm. I, I really love this bit, and I'm glad that you brought this up, is, again, something that was very much in my, my childhood is mm -hmm. you're the adult, you are the one in control. Mm. We are still, as adults, in control. Mm -hmm. We are the ones giving the child the options that are available. Mm -hmm. But what's great is then your child can then have their control into it by picking mm -hmm. one of them. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a child who's then, which they will do, and it, this is probably one of the most prevalent trigger that I have, is a child is trying to create their own control. They feel like everything is put upon them, and so they fight against it. Mm -hmm. So if you as an adult provide the option, you are the one in control. If they're picking a fifth option, you're like, no, 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 no. Here's the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Here are the two options. Because, again, that, I'll try not to digress into boundaries. That's a whole other bit again. Mm. But if you say, here is what is okay. You can have this or you can have this. Mm -hmm. And if they then choose, then they feel like they are valued, that they are yeah. listened to. And that makes them also feel in control. It's all about balance. It's not about hierarchy. It's none of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's about balance. And if you've got balance, then everybody thrives. Mm, because it's not about those power dynamics. And yeah. When that kicks in, then that makes the child um, push back, like you say. It's important yeah. to eliminate those power dynamics as much as possible and both be on the kind of the same level, even though the traditional view is that the adult kind of is higher up and has all the control actually if you are on the same level as your child then there's more of that understanding and respect and it's mutual respect isn't it and that's so exactly. important and that is it's that it's not about authority it's about respect mm. Mm. you respect your child your child will respect you if you mm. demand respect eventually they will say no 
It might not be now, but it will happen eventually. Mm -hmm. So if you don't come in with this authoritative, authoritarian, you must listen to me because I'm older, unfortunately, your child will get older and then they'll go, I don't care. So if you have Mm -hmm. this relationship where you are understanding, you accept that all behavior is natural Mm -hmm. and help them through it. And again, even put your hands up and go, look, I messed up. And you're trying mm-hmm. like, oh, that's normal to happen. Yeah. That means that they can cope when when they get older. They can co regulate well, self-regulate themselves mm-hmm. because we've given them the tools to do so. Mm-hmm. Rather than you must listen to me. Because then you've got adults that go, I don't know what to do because someone's not telling me how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we all know how precious it is getting these kind of coping mechanisms in in those early stages. Mm-hmm. yeah definitely and what you were just saying about um admitting that you were in the wrong that reminds me of um also almost modeling to the child to a child that um it's okay to have a bad day and to be upset like we were saying earlier and sometimes saying you know if the if a, if your child or a child in a setting approaches you and says you're looking sad or what's wrong it's okay to say I'm feeling a little bit sad today because of this reason you know because I'm tired or because this happened and I guess it's just about finding the right balance like you say what is appropriate at what age uh, or a stage of development more so what does the child understand um, and how much you as an adult can almost open up to the child because again that's part of modeling isn't it and also demonstrating um trust as well in in Again. the fact that you know I as an adult I can trust you as the child to um understand my emotion but that is really modeling that the child is able to do the same to an adult and I think the important bit you said there was stage appropriate mm. obviously if you start saying do you know what mummy's had a really bad day this has happened and this has happened one the communication for a two-year-old it'll go whoosh Mm-hmm. again if you said it to a five-year-old it could be quite complex they can understand mm-hmm. there's like they can feel empathy by this point they mm-hmm. can understand you're sad but we want to be able to make sure that we keep it still simple because we have much more complex emotions than children mm-hmm. have so absolutely saying do you know what having a bad day mommy didn't sleep very much um mm-hmm. and those kind of things and if she, if they and offer something to try and make you feel good then go yeah that would be great like mommy would you need a hug like yeah I'd love a hug that would make me feel better Mm -hmm. because then they can feel like they're they're doing something they're co-regulating with you because you've taught them Mm -hmm. that um but making sure that as an adult that there has to be a boundary we don't offload onto our children yeah because Mm -hmm. that again it's something that they don't understand and I don't think anyone really would be doing this but it's all about Mm -hmm. like I said this balance so that's why I'm saying it is we don't offload onto our children. We still make mm-hmm. it age relevant. We are, we are happy to say, I'm not having a good day. I don't take it out on you, but I'm also, it's okay for me to be a bit quiet. Mm-hmm. I'm just having yeah. a quiet day. Just a it's bit really sad today. Mm, Modelling that communication, isn't it? So then they yeah. can do the same when they are having perhaps a big emotion. And they may not themselves know the reason for it, but they can start to communicate I'm not sure how I'm feeling or I think I'm feeling a bit sad and and also vocabulary as well so using a range of vocabulary with children so using language like I'm feeling frustrated or anxious or nervous um, and using those words in context so the children do have that kind of toolbox you know they're equipped with that vocab that they can use to communicate their emotions as well Exactly, because as like I said right at the beginning, and the reason why I use the term translator mm-hmm. is behaviour is communication. If any adult listening to this and you think about the issues you've had with your other half or other family members, mm-hmm. nine times out of ten, if you think about how it could have been resolved, it's probably a simple step of communication not being mm-hmm. expressed. So if we can teach our children to communicate by being great role models in communicating, Imagine the generation we're going to bring up being able to Mm -hmm. express how they feel 
rather having angry or upset adults that are just battling with each other mm-hmm. not being able to create these amazing relationships and mm-hmm. environments for themselves and hopefully their family because what we teach our children now makes a big 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 impact mm-hmm. yeah for generations to, to come absolutely this whole societal effect isn't it rather than just right in this moment between you and one child there was something that uh, could be slightly digressing here, but it was something mm-hmm. that was said to me by actually a mindset professional. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love it. So I can't I can't take full credit for this at all. <laughs> um, if you want to look into it, she's called Cassie Watts. Um, but she said, if you think about it, you've got, if you look to your right, you've got a few people to your right. On your left, you have thousands upon thousands of people to your left. And these are all the people that have come before you. Every single one of them have this backpack that they're passing down and passing down and passing down. And then we've got to the point that we've got this backpack. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we are the generation that is going, I'm not passing on this backpack until I open it up, take all these bits out and put new things back in. Mm-hmm. and that is that generational trauma quite often mm-hmm. we will parent how we were parented or go the complete opposite direction go no I don't want anything to do with that yeah but it is that bit of right let, let's let not just pass on this backpack onto mm-hmm. our children and teach them this is how we cope or this is bad and this is good not passing it on just going like this is all normal mm-hmm. imagine if we again create a generation of it's all normal Mm-hmm. rather than feeling like accepting and understanding exactly, individuals exactly, yeah. rather than trying to find their way through the world because they don't feel like they can fit anywhere because they've mm-hmm. been taught that this is bad this is not normal and this is not okay mm-hmm. so yeah it's something I get quite passionate about so I try not to get too much <laughs> from my soapbox there but I, I think these things that to adults or practitioners like this feels like a huge weight on our mm-hmm. shoulders to be able to do this but actually it's really simple it's just because you don't know. When you don't know something, it seems massive. It seems scary. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you get these very simple, practical, they're not easy, but they are mm-hmm. simple and practical. And once you practice them, they get easier. Same with anything. Mm-hmm. And I really like that um, analogy. And um, I think it really reminds me of how we we often react, respond in, in ways that we are used to being treated and it's just kind of it's become natural and it is really difficult to sometimes change these behaviors because that is just what we've seen you know as children growing up and that's how we've been treated um but what um someone said to me before is that it can end with you so you know that reminds me of what you're saying about the backpack and um it's it's almost like seeing kind of a certain way that perhaps you as an adult react yeah. Um, is there's a reason for it you know because you, that's how you were treated as a child for instance yeah. that's the reaction you got but it's not your excuse so yeah. you know you you can say okay this is why I do it and therefore be kind to yourself and recognize yeah. why but yeah. also think okay but it's not going to be my excuse because I'm going to change it and I'm going to work hard and trying to change exactly it's it kind of not takes like all the onus upon you as if it's all you Mm. that has to deal with all of this but it's it's kind of going like I'm the custodian I can't say the word but you get what I mean Mm. of Mm -hmm. this backpack Mm -hmm. I'm the person with this backpack now Mm -hmm. so I could just pass it on and that's the easy and simple way to do this yeah but actually I'm going to take it apart Mm -hmm. because that means I can set my child up or I can set these children up for success. Mm-hmm. And again, it, it just keeps coming back to practice. Practice something new, you become better at it. And this is what I speak about with my clients. So when I do either one-to-one work or we have a link where we do, it's called the Pocket Expert, where they can contact me on a one-to-one basis um, mm-hmm. just through WhatsApp or anything like that, is here's a strategy. Here's how to work. And if you keep with it consistently, because we know that children work better with consistency, Mm -hmm. you'll be able to direct the behavior 
and the communication, all those kind of things, exactly where you want it to be. And then you can also then be the practitioner or parent that you want to be. Nobody wants to be this screaming adult that's getting frustrated mm. and angry. No one goes, oh, yeah. I'm going to strive for a child and I'm going to be that parent. Everyone mm. wants to be this parent, but we might not have been shown how. And the mm. only way to be know how to do it is either someone who's more knowledgeable to share it with us mm-hmm. or to go looking for that information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and definitely. so that's what I do with my clients of going I'm here to help you and give you this direction I'm here someone who's worked in the industry for nearly 15 years and go this is how I can help you you are not mm-hmm. at doing this alone you don't have to figure this out you don't have to take on all that pressure I can help you mm-hmm. and shorten that time frame from generations to this generation mm-hmm. and th- I think the important thing is knowing that you're not alone in this, um, yeah. especially as a carer or a parent and understanding that everybody goes through difficult times and not there isn't a perfect parent out there. there isn't. Um, and, and that it's OK that you're making perhaps mistakes or maybe not being as patient or as, um, I guess, loving as you want to be. You know, it's not that you're not a loving person or a loving parent. It's just because you may be struggling to self-regulate just like your child does. I think it's a perfect way with this. We're going back to the beginning Mm -hmm. of how do you look after the first steps and you go, you Mm -hmm. need to look after yourself. If you're comparing yourself to every other parent, which you Mm -hmm. only see a snapshot, you have absolutely no idea what is going on. You can guess, but that is a Mm -hmm. guess. If you are putting yourself down as oh my god I'm that parent or I'm that practitioner Mm -hmm. then you're not coming from a good place so if you're looking after yourself and saying okay this is what's happening I am not a bad parent I have made a mistake Mm -hmm. or I have done this or I haven't done that if you take all this pressure off because the only person who's putting that pressure upon you is yourself Mm -hmm. it's what's going on in that language that you're saying to yourself so if you can go do you know what I'm actually an awesome practitioner I'm an awesome parent I'm gonna make mistakes Mm -hmm. but I'm gonna own up to them I'm gonna Mm -hmm. acknowledge them and then I'm gonna move on and I guess it's important to recognize that um, sometimes it's all you can give that day perhaps because your energy levels might be dipped you know you might be going through a tough time or whatever it might be it's important to recognize that you're not able to give your 100% or 80% or whatever it is or actually what you are giving today may act may be your 100% it's just yeah. not you know what you usually are used to giving perhaps yeah, it, you cannot be 100% every single day it's unrealistic it's only going to make you feel like a failure when you're not mm-hmm. um, and has this unrealistic expectation that you cannot fulfill it is impossible And it's not like me saying it's impossible as if like that's suddenly like a challenge. Mm. It's it's a challenge that you won't meet and it's only going to make you feel rubbish. So if you just go, do you know what, there's going to be great days when I feel at 100%. Mm -hmm. Might not be 100%, but you feel it. And there's going to be days when you feel at 10%. Mm. That's when you start, obviously, you've got to make sure that you've got some kind of support system around you, whether it's against Mm -hmm. staff, whether it's your other half, whether it's your family, whether it's, any kind of thing where you can go do you know what I've got 20% and then someone goes do you know what I've got the other 80 today Mm. I'll come help and so you still have that 100% you've just done it between the pair of you or as a group Mm -hmm. so if you can like to like quite a few parents have like antenatal classes and then Mm -hmm. carry on forward go I'm having a bad day guys um can we all meet up and they go like I've got 10 someone goes I've got 20 I've got another Mm -hmm. 20 someone's got I've got 15 you've made your 100% Mm-hmm. so you can share it out mm. connection is so be, important like, isn't it yeah mm-hmm. massively massively important mm-hmm. we were built to connect mm-hmm. we're not very good on our own whenever you look at history and you look how people are on their own lonesome they don't last particularly well mentally mm-hmm. and sometimes physically mm-hmm. oh well um i think we'll leave it there as we can go on and on and on <laughs> absolutely i think you and i are quite <laughs> quite renowned for talking a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we did. We both did very well, kind of trying to um, not go off um, 
of peace too much as we normally yeah. do in our conversations <laughs> um so yeah i'll just say for our listeners that you can read more from Gemma on the voice of early childhood website and i'm sure you'll be back on because we've already touched on so many points that would be great to explore further but um wait to come on again it will be amazing i love <laughs> love this space that you've created and Thank i'm you. more than happy to keep coming in and chatting with you and helping all your audience members in any way I can um but yes mm. I am the toddler translator and you're more than welcome to come and find me www.thetoddlertranslator.co.uk and can I just say I love the the title and the alliteration <laughs> and the fact that Thank you mentioned you so earlier <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you for um, the advice and the insights into your own practice. And we'll speak again soon. Soon.